Right. Welcome to our panel. Our foot's in the door. Now what? Now what? This panel is aimed primarily at students, but also those early in their career um, who would probably find this conversation that we're going to have today useful. As we discovered when putting the slides together for this, um, this panel's actually evolved over the past two years. Um, we met on the Discord channel as well as through uh, DigiPen and decided we were going to like expand upon what students feel as they go through the UX and UR experience. So uh, this has gone on. Now, now people have their, their feet in the doors and we're going to kind of go over what has changed from those two years past as to what we are now. So with that, um, we did have one panelist who was unable to make it today. Uh, thank you, Charles, for all your involvement. Um, but today, here's our panel. We're going to start with introductions. Jimmy, take it away. Hey, I'm Jimmy Zhou. So did my master's in computational media at University of California, Santa Cruz, and I have a bachelor's in chemistry. Uh, I was an intern at NetEase Games, and then right after that, I hopped into being a, a UX lab analyst at Epic Games right before this. And then afterwards, I am starting my new role at Riot Games as a researcher in a week. So. Hi, I'm James. I'm a uh, recent DigiPen Institute of Technology grad with a BA in game design. I primarily was either the primary or, or only uh, Grux person, UX or UR on multiple teams during my time there, and uh, including a small uh, indie team uh, studio I did contract work with. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking for work now being graduated, so yeah. Yep, and I'm Matt, uh, and just like James, uh, I also graduated in April from DigiPen Institute of Technology with a BA in game design as well as a minor in psychology. And um, a few months ago, I actually finished a contract position as a research assistant at WB Games, and yeah, currently looking for my next opportunity. And I'm Jen Ash. I'm the moderator for this panel. I'm a design lead at Bungie and discipline lead for the UI UX org. I've worked there for nearly eight years on Destiny, started as a user researcher, and then transitioned to UX design for Destiny 2. Our first slide today is going to be about early role expectations. I think there's a lot of interesting uh, unknowns when students hear what user research and what UX design is about. Um, so we're just going to talk about what what are your first impressions and how have they changed? Um, I believe we're going to start with Matt. Yeah, so my early kind of expectation of what a user researcher was, was essentially just figuring out what a player liked or disliked about a game. And that was kind of it. Um, but obviously, um, through my experience, it's kind of, that's kind of changed. Um, I also grew to understand that you you kind of work alongside the development team and through all stages of development. Um, another expectation um, that I had was essentially that user research was the very last thing to be done was after the game is almost ready to be shipped, you go ahead and test and go, okay, do people like it or not? Um, but that's obviously not the case. Um, and then I guess finally, one of the things that I always thought um, because of learning about research in school was that it was uh, that games user research is actually very similar or like almost a one-to-one -one with academic research. And that is, um, in my experience, definitely not the case. Uh, so I was told about user research by old professor, um, Catherine Isfister, and I didn't know what it was and I was too afraid to ask her, so I Wikipedia'd it. And <laughs> so my initial definition was that a user researcher focuses on user behaviors, needs, and et cetera, through like observation methods and like feedback methodologies. So that was like the base definition I had. <laughs> um, over time, obviously it's changed more. Um, I think the overall goal is still the same. Just the nuance of it is balancing kind of like designer intent and player needs and expectations. And I think that it differs across many people. And I feel like once you get down to the nitty gritty, like you as a researcher in the Discord and everywhere else, we'll have similar but different definitions of what a user researcher is. <laughs> so you want to take what UX yeah. you thought of? And you Oh boy. <laughs> uh, and you are? Well, here, I'll stick with UX because that's right. a big gig. Um, uh, so at the beginning, I would say we were mostly, at least in our experience, we were mostly taught uh, UX uh, uh, skills like alongside like UI design skills. So it was mostly just wireframing um, and 
a little bit of interaction design, but honestly, not even that really much. Uh, and it was also player archetypes and personas are a huge thing that uh, we would be learning and understanding. And that would be like your main job is the the champion of those. But uh, obviously, over the years, and as anyone in this panel probably knows, the uh, the term UX is kind of vague and can change depending on uh, on on the company, of course. Um, uh, but even still now, my peers and seniors kind of disagree on what UX is. Uh, some, there are uh, people that would say player experience for certain things like game feel, uh, especially that, that was a huge argument uh, in the last couple of years of whether uh, game feel or sandbox designers or, uh, or UX uh, or, or, and UX design was like all together necessarily. But um, for the most part, I would say now it's it's a lot more and you're a lot more uh, in, sorry, you're a lot more <laughs> actually, <laughs> you're a lot more involved with the whole process than what was originally taught. There's a lot more to UX design than originally your first glance, which I guess is why maybe it's so big. <laughs> yeah, I think you bring up a good point that player experience sometimes gets uh, is a hard one to differentiate for a lot of companies and disciplines to understand like what is the line, what is the discipline and defining what that is and I think we're everyone's still kind of working on growing that on teams and maturity and whatnot. So, yeah. Good point. All right, similar to what your role expectations were, we're going to move on to the next slide, which is early expectations. So uh, what are some expectations that may have shifted when you were in classes studying the topics compared to when you started working on larger student projects and industry um, projects as well? Um, yeah, so the big thing for me has been um, that's kind of changed is timeline for projects. Um, you know, in school, I'd say you have five assignments and due by the end of the week. So I would work on assignment one on Monday, assignment two on Tuesday, so on and such forth. Whereas in the industry, um, it's a lot more faster paced than that. And you have to sometimes juggle multiple tasks at once. You don't necessarily get the luxury of focusing on one single thing for an entire day and then focus on another thing another day. Sometimes you have to do um, with coming up with a lot of study prep, you know, you have to do recruiting, schedule it, like there's a whole bunch of things that need to be done all within the span of a single workday. Um, so that was definitely something that definitely changed for me, um, as well as uh, how my work kind of affects other people. You know, at, in school, if I don't do well on an assignment, that kind of just reflects on me and I go, well, whatever. But if I um, don't necessarily do a task correctly or if I take too much time on something, my work then kind of affects the other researchers as well. So that's something that definitely uh, kind of surprised me and a big change from school. Okay, uh, one thing that was very different for me for working in history compared to academia was like working with other disciplines, uh, especially for grad school. Since I was in the purely like academic grad school, I handled pretty much everything for my projects. Like I was the designer, the programmer, the user researcher, everything. Uh, and I think even if you're in a school uh, like, I don't know, you, uh, Full Sail, DigiPen, University of Utah, it's not like you get the chance to work with like data analysts or like creative director <laughs> or, or people like that. Like there's no hierarchy because you're all in the student team. Uh, so like working with other disciplines was like a jarring new thing to me. Like having to, because in school, I didn't really have to push for people to look at my research it was more of a push to get people to like understand the research or like fight back on the research or see if anything's wrong with it uh, in industry sometimes like the unexpected first step is to actually get people to look at it which is uh, a little bit frustrating at times but i think it's just a necessary step of everything like you have to learn how to work with like every other discipline and um i've gotten so many opportunities to work with like different people that it's really made me understand like the, like talking to like every role requires like a different thing, right? Like every role values something different. You have to find that language to like mesh with them and get them to understand what you're trying to do and make sure that you can work in sync from then on. If you were able to go back and uh, tell your past self something of what you were in grad school, what would you tell them to help prepare to kind of like 
talk between disciplines in your situation. Jesus, uh, you get an internship? <laughs> it's, I mean, it's hard, right? In grad school, you don't really have those roles. I think uh, getting an internship is really good, but at the same time, getting involved with the community, right? Like a lot of the GERD Discord discusses soft skills all the time. And then initially when I was a student, I'd be like, okay, I got to focus on my hard skills first anyways. But now it's like later, gradually as I grow, I'm just like, how the, how the fuck do I talk to a creative director? <laughs> so um, I think like if you have a solid community, you should talk to them and, and try to understand like how they approach different people. Because uh, that's really good advice from people who have already tried it and it does work. Like you can carry some of the lessons over. Uh, I would have told myself in grad school to like um, really try to interact with the community more and also like try for an internship early on because my first year of grad school I spent like not looking for an internship in the games community and I don't think uh, I got lucky with the second year but I think it definitely like slowed down my understanding of how industry works because grad school is really insular in who you talk to like they may be doing different things but they're all researchers so <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh, kind of building off of that um i just would say whoever you're working with uh whatever discipline just have the mindset of that you're trying to empower and inform their work uh so i'll give a couple examples uh one uh, i worked uh, a couple examples for me uh, i worked with a system designer very uh, heavily where it's a pretty it's pretty simple um uh, like it's mostly data analytics that we would use uh, and like jimmy said you're not like at digipen we don't get to work with a data analyst i am the data analyst and it's a uh, and not an actual you know not like uh, like data analyst that you would have in an industry either so you have to work with what you have um, but you do your best to reveal relevant information for that team member. So like for that, uh, if you're making a competitive multiplayer game, uh, knowing how characters are giving them information of how characters performing, where they are, et cetera, like actually creating these tests to, uh, <laughs> to, uh, um, help them understand what is going on and how players are actually playing their game uh, would be uh, is is super helpful. Um, with artists, I typically only worked with a UI artist uh, specifically, but uh, having making sure that their artwork is being conveyed correctly is super important to them. I found um, so like they want this to be in their style, right? You you don't ever like test their style I don't even know how you do that but <laughs> you would uh you do want to make sure that what they are trying to convey is actually getting across so once again you just help reveal that relevant in information and I find when you approach it that way uh, uh those team members will see value in your work and also actually uh and actually read your reports afterwards because they'll be like, oh, hey, I actually learned something last time and I can use that later. And they can also look back on it and be like, okay, well, people thought this with this icon, um, this is kind of similar, probably shouldn't do that again or should do that again, you know, whatever the information reveals for them. So it can um, help kind of grow different skill sets as well as just, uh, provide information sounds like yeah jimmy oh i was just saying well, we have a few qa questions are we doing it we're oh. doing it right we're or... gonna do it at the end yeah okay. Okay. yeah uh all right i think that takes uh we're wrapped up that one uh the next slide that we're gonna look at is academia versus professional experience so we're kind of building from early expectations into more detail about information that we've learned so when you've moved from academia to industry, what are some skills that you uh, that still apply today or maybe that you've built off of? Uh, I guess I'll go first. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. right. um, so uh, one of the, some of the skills that definitely helped me in both situations is just having that fundamental of research, um, just kind of knowing you know how to set up a study, how to moderate a study, um, the difference between methodologies, those um, those foundations definitely helped me so that I could 
focus more of my time and energy learning on the new skills, uh, such as like how to recruit participants. You know, that's something that they don't really teach, um, or at least in my experience, that never uh, really got taught at Digifen very well. It was mostly me just running around grabbing whoever, like whatever student, and just being like, hey, come test my game. Hey, I was your TA. You want to help me out? And I'll, you know, help you out a little bit. Come test my game. Things like that. Um, whereas in industry, you know, there's, there's screenings and there's different things to help that, uh, that specific process, but definitely having just the base knowledge, um, allowed me to just focus my time and energy, like I said, on the new things. Yeah, I would, uh, kind of continue off that. Uh, I would say that the what we kind of labeled as a rigid framework uh, in uh, at the early stages of learning in school, uh, which is like you you do it this way, this way, and this way. Uh, it's very uh, academic in that sense. Why that might not be how it is in the industry, or even if you're just making if you're making a game in general, you're, that's not really how it works. Having that uh, really gives you a really strong foundation. And that helps you understand how each step affects the others. Um, so like, if you're like, uh, you're usually, now I've seen mostly roles for like moderators show up uh, for like entry level positions. I've seen that when applying. Um, so having a good understanding of, well, why is this step important for the entire process, the research process as a whole, makes you a better moderator well, ma makes you disciplined in a sense, if that makes sense, so. Yeah, um, so I will talk about the working with both qualitative and quantitative methods. Um, in previous experience, I haven't really worked, so in academia, like you handle quant constantly, right? Like it's it's a, it's kind of expected that every paper is going to have quant, whether it deserves it or is using it correctly or not, <laughs> as long as it has it in some form, right? <laughs> um, I mean, I disagreed with that. Uh, and in industry, you, you, I used it a bit less, uh, just because in industry you have like data analysts to handle like a large scale like quantitative analysis stuff, right? Um, I did. I did work with it. Not. I'm not saying like it was completely absent. I'm just saying like most of my career has been mostly a focus on qualitative research, and uh, I'm fine with that. I like qualitative <laughs> better. I'm more of a qualitative specialist, anyways. Um, but I can do quant, and quant is useful. No, right? Like knowing quant also allows you to talk with like different roles. Like data analysts become much easier to talk to. If you use Tableau, you kind of like troubleshoot it with their own reports as well. Things like that. Um, I've just seen less quant than in industry that I personally worked with than in academia where it was like expected out of everything. So that was a different change because a lot of the job um, roles were saying like, you need quant and then you need quant, you need quant. And then sometimes like talking to people from those roles are like, I asked them like, oh, how do you do that? And they're like, oh, I mean, not often. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's surprising when you get to industry <laughs> if you're going for these roles. I know some jobs still use a lot of quant. So obviously don't take my word on it that it's like all cool and everything so <laughs> yeah I think you bring up a good point that it's important to understand it like similar to what we talked about before where there's like it's important to be able to talk to other disciplines so it's also important to understand what the data is that you're getting potentially um, and build off of that conversation instead of having to start start from scratch and try to interpret things so I think that all kind of loops back to that topic point uh, regarding that, um, yeah. yeah. See, are there any other thoughts on this? Otherwise, we'll move on to the next slide. I think. Next slide is surprises from experience. Um, you've all mentioned how perceptions and methods have evolved over time as you've gotten more experience. But what are some examples of things that have surprised you? Uh, let's start with team dynamics. All right. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, one of the biggest surprises is just working on a team um for me i was the solo like in school i was the only one on um on all of my game projects as the sole user researcher so i didn't really necessarily have to answer to anyone or anything like that it was kind of like i did the things that i wanted to do and then i i just went with it whereas going into the industry especially as a research assistant i had people that i, I had researchers that i answered to and it made me 
uh, it made me figure out that I still had a lot to learn, uh, more than I initially expected. Um, and so, and one of the big things for me was kind of having to build that trust with the researchers and with any, all of my coworkers, um, because you don't, you, going into that role, um, I, you know, I, these are new people that I'm working with, so we don't have that uh, trust built up yet. Um, and so that comes from uh, me asking clarifying questions and not being afraid to ask any questions uh, because it, when, when you do get into industry, you realize that there, there's a lot of things that you just don't really know because of the lack of, I guess, hands-on experience sometimes, um, especially in, um, in the games industry. So making sure that you're really asking people things and be willing to learn, um, that's one of the biggest things that kind of surprised, that I was surprised with myself was how much, how much I still needed to grow um, and how much I still needed to learn, but yeah. James and Jimmy, have you what what are have you ever run into having to build trust, and what were some techniques that you used in order to kind of like build on those? Uh, bribing. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Okay. <laughs> I mean, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> trust is uh, a difficult part of the job. Um, like the the typical route I take for people, like the. <laughs> The, the the least opposition route that I've had is just like gradually talking to someone or like making sure I was part of their like daily work cycle, right? Like talking about the uh, steps of my report, like what's happening, what's going on, being like transparent about the steps I'm taking for it, like working with other roles. And I think this make, for some people, this makes them rely on you more, where they're more willing to like talk back and forth, have a dialogue about what they want. It becomes clearer and it becomes easier to like kind of do my uh, design a study around it and also like uh, or like do a competitive analysis stuff like that like when you when you when you don't have like a moving goal post <laughs> so uh the earliest advice i can give like is try to talk to people as often as you can like make sure they know you exist uh because i think that's a problem for some roles as well is that <laughs> some teams just don't realize that user research exists as a team <laughs> so <laughs> first step <Yeah. laughs> prove your existence <laughs> Or that they can reach out to you, like that's a big part too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that you're there to help and support yeah. them. James? Yeah, consistency. I would say consistency is uh, is probably the best way. Mm, kind of like what Jimmy said, like consistently be there, you know, one. Uh, not just at the job, but like actually showing your work, talking to them, showing them value. Because I would say the first, like it's kind of like the same with everything. Like the first thing is starting that relationship, right? Like starting that trust. The, that first step is the hardest. And then from then on, you're able to build off of that first impression, essentially. And uh, if you're consistent, that builds pretty well. Yeah. All right. Um... I'll, pro I'll probably take over for following from like team dynamics. Um, a big thing coming in for me was uh, knowing when to concede. <laughs> I think a lot of students are very gung ho about UX, and it's a good thing. But at the same time, bringing that same kind of intensity can potentially hurt relationships, uh, especially since like UX is a balancing act where you have to be convincing people that uh, what you're doing is helpful for the work as well overall, and that you're there to help them along the way and like uh support them in whatever they need so yeah when you do argue for player needs sometimes that hurts the dynamic for later on like say you argue with like a lead designer and the argument takes a bit too far you're trying to push for this a little hard and then that relationship is broken that means potentially in the future that lead designer won't be talking to the user research team or at least you right like they won't want to work with you and our one of our hardest problems is getting people to work with us so you have to know you have to realize that sometimes you have to like pick your battles. And I think, yeah, Ashley put as a status, like pick your battles. No, that's too many battles, put some back. I think that's a really apt description of our role. Like, please don't pick too many battles. You don't want to be known as the guy who like bulldozes past everything. Like that's, that's bad. <laughs> uh, there are like, in general, uh, knowing when to concede has helped me in a lot of my relationships. Uh, like there are some relationships where definitely like really early on where I pushed a little too hard because I was new, right? And that relationship was like made it much harder to work with. But simultaneously later on when I realized like what I had to do 
knowing when to concede also helped me build these relationships. Like I still talk to a lot of people who from those companies that I used to work at and we still like regularly chat, like we're, we're friends now and created like a really good working relationship with us and like an outside of work relationship for us too. So. Have you ever had to bandaid up a relationship and uh, what, what kind of work to build towards that? Was it, was it building trust again? Was it offering to help? Was it, like, uh, was there a way to build that bridge up from being burned? For some people, there are ways of building that bridge up. But for some people, it's like that bridge has been burned. Like, they're very quick to just, like, set it on fire and leave it behind them. <laughs> but, like, uh, it, when I was an intern, it, that relationship was easier to band-aid up just by, um, b by, like, the privilege of being able to say that I was new, right? Like, making a mistake or something and pushing things too hard it's easy to apologize and kind of talk to them and then like work through them what they thought was wrong with your work as well when uh, in, oh, i was going to uh, ask for student projects did you run across anything like that too or working with people other disciplines that may have lost trust in you um and but you're in a different relationship because you're both students right you're not no one's really beholden to like a product or anything like that to the same extent, maybe. Yeah, Was yeah. Is there for anything? <laughs> yeah. For stu students are divas, and they have the attention span <laughs> of squirrels. Uh, <laughs> students are easy. To, students are easier to work with, I think. Uh, students were like, I mean, you for students like you do a little makeup, you give them time to cool down, and like you do something nice for them, and it's forgotten <laughs> or like, it, it's slightly <laughs> over. Because like at the end of the day, a lot of students are just friends. Uh, or like acquaintances of some sort. It is not the same thing for a working environment. Like one person from another team does not have to talk to you again. <laughs> they do not have to like you and they do not have to see you on a daily basis. <laughs> so uh, I think students are much easier to work with. If you're a student and you're listening to this and you're having trouble with your team, uh, it's easy to integrate. Like just establish yourself as the user research, user research, user researcher in the team early on. And like, if you're pushing too hard, it's kind of obvious because that person will yell at you or cry, one of the two. <laughs> Or both. They could yeah. yell at you. Uh, and James, did you have any experiences like that? Uh, that have to, can you repeat the question specifically? Sorry. Yeah, uh, sort, sort of like building off of like, did you ever like burn a bridge with someone on a project, basically? Maybe not burn a bridge to that level, but like lost their trust, like didn't deliver something that maybe they found useful, didn't answer a question, and they were just like, I don't see the point in interacting with you. I mean, um, I did don't, you ever gain their trust again? I, I don't think... I've ever lost trust. If anything, it's more of like you give someone something and they find it completely not useful <laughs> and uh, they just kind of ignore it. Uh, and like if they don't find it useful, then, you know, that's that's that. You can learn from that, right? Uh, but I wouldn't say that, I don't know, it's hard to, it's hard to lose trust with peers like Jimmy was kind of saying. Like people do do people people do kind of get over it a little bit they may not i don't know maybe they talk behind your back i don't know uh, oh, <laughs> but but like uh i i don't i don't think it's so much of a loss of trust it's just more like they they lose sight in why they should care you know and getting that is kind of you're just restarting again you're taking the first step again uh it, if anything i don't think it's really uh damaging burning burning bridges is is isn't what i would call it but i'm sure that could happen <laughs> but you would have to i think you would have to try real hard not to do your job right to do that personally <laughs> like that would be that would be they would they would know everything about what you're doing and they would think that you like lied like if you faked data obviously that would be bad right so yeah, bad. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that <laughs> Uh, but I will say this, uh, what would probably help is if you're able to check yourself. So sometimes, uh, my kind of point with this part of the knowing when to concede, uh, was that I don't, sometimes you're, especially with smaller teams, you're not always like someone isn't necessarily fighting against you exactly. They're, they're, they might have a lot of respect for you and everything. So, um, you have to kind of know when to challenge yourself and almost concede to your your better logic of what's best for the project and obviously working with like producers really helps with that and leads obviously but 
uh, if that if that isn't really available or that's not really working for whatever reason, um, you can, it's, it's a good habit to have, to want to like assess your own wants and your own, I guess, expertise and how it actually affects the whole project. So like, obviously there, are, I mean, for example, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, things with the games I've worked on that, that I think would would have made the game way better, but I know that the team wouldn't have liked that. That's not the game that they would want to make, and I would never push that because you gotta. Even though I would, they would let me necessarily push that because of whatever trust you might have, or because it's a small team or peers, I guess as well. Uh, you do have to know when to not yourself, you know, just so you don't accidentally burn those bridges uh, those relationships without even knowing it was happening makes sense any other thoughts on this topic otherwise i think i'm going to move on to the next one all right next one coolest things you've done we focused a bit on like we've been focusing a lot on comparison but now let's just take a moment to maybe reflect fondly on some of the things that coolest things that you feel like you've done so far uh, once uh first. yeah i can start off with this uh nda uh pretty much <laughs> <laughs> across the board nda uh the coolest thing i can probably describe is just like uh in grad school i developed a vr dancing game for two people using like one system and i got to present it at spain for like a conference so that was cool uh, especially since i was just the master student that wasn't like really uh, required or expected of me so i really enjoyed that how did you go about kind of getting that opportunity like like you said, like it's not really common for master's students. What, what did you set up for that? Uh, I think it's a mixture of like what I want to do and what my professor Catherine wanted me to do as well. Like Catherine is tends to be the person who like really supports and encourages you, but also like encour encourages you to like do beyond what you can do. <laughs> like, uh, so she was like, "Oh, okay, so your master's students." Like, so I like I think you should go for like at least two conferences. I'm like, "Oh, uh, that's." very different from what every other professor has told me <laughs> sure i can try that uh yeah i mean it was an interesting opportunity to do research as well because one of my like first research projects and i had to like it was a really messed up situation where i had to like evaluate how the spectators felt about the game how like one player using one role felt about the game and how the other player felt during the game because it's meant to be like a spectator experience as well so the study design was very confusing. If you look at my initial rough drafts, don't look at that. <laughs> uh, it's impossible to follow. And it, like, it, early on, it led me to find out a lot of like, what I was lacking. So that was a good experience for me. It was the coolest thing I've done that I can talk about without being sued. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, all right. So I guess for me, some of the coolest things I've done um, I've also in school worked on a VR project. And so getting that experience of uh, dealing with motion sickness and simulation sickness in players and finding ways to mitigate that, that was definitely a fun yet very stressful experience. Um, Cause you know, last thing you want is for people to get sick playing your game. <laughs> um, uh, otherwise um, getting the opportunity uh, as uh, being in the industry, getting to work on, I've worked on a bunch of different like single player, multiplayer projects as well as multi-platform. So I've worked on PC console projects as well as mobile. So getting just a little bit of experience and research in all of these different platforms and genres um, really taught me a lot. So that's been super cool. Uh, for me, probably the most fun that I have had uh, in working on something was this uh, post-game design screen that I've worked on for the past year, uh, which is essentially a uh, a post game experience that helps players uh, actually like learn and improve themselves in the game or just simply actually pay attention to the post game stats at the end. Uh, so some examples of what some of you may have actually seen is like Riot does this a lot with their games. Uh, League. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Riot. Yeah. Jimmy's like, Ooh, Riot. <laughs> uh, uh, but also like just esports in general, like StarCraft was kind of the pioneer uh, with uh, their esports, which is uh, they uh, they would just show obviously these visualizations, this used data viz to actually convey these uh, these um, 
the actual post game uh, stats for players and players would actually be able to, well, not, not with post game with Starcraft specifically, but with this, uh, it was post game. Uh, so right after you just, you're able to get a whole breakdown of the game. Um, I went through a pretty rigorous research process for about uh, three months of like actually figuring out what players I actually wanted to see. Surprisingly enough, uh, of course, uh, it depends on the player, but surprisingly enough, people didn't care about ultimates. That's a, that's a good little, tidbit i guess like that was a thing that was surprising that was a pretty big uh point of that design as well like showing like abilities and ultimates on like a timeline and on uh like when they were used and whatnot and no one cared so it was really good to do that research before we implemented it because <laughs> that would have been a lot of work to get that to work so yeah it was uh super fun to work on that going back a bit matt you mentioned uh, testing on different platforms and doing VR and uh, mobile and I believe what was it like PC probably yeah. um, what what were some takeaways from researching on those different platforms like was it did you have to use different techniques for those were they did it met like what were some differences between those um, yes yeah, so um, with VR it's definitely uh, always um, something that I've learned is always making sure that if someone has the slightest uh, inclination of like, um, or the slightest sign of um, like motion sickness to definitely ask, like, let them know like, hey, you, you can take a break, you can stop, don't like, don't push yourself. Um, because yeah, that's the very last thing you want. Um, also, something that I, um, that I learned with this specific VR project, because it was a it was a horror game, um, was definitely uh, asking people if they play horror games and if they like them. Uh, that's something that I, I did the first few tests and forgot that little bit. Uh, so definitely making sure that you're not scaring people uh, in the wrong way um, and potentially traumatizing them. That's something I I learned. Um, but yeah, and then for mobile, I guess. Um, just the way just the way mobile games work and just seeing how people play mobile games uh it was it was interesting it was it was interesting to see because having people in kind of a lab setting playing a mobile game um personally i f i feel like the the way they played the game in the lab is not the same as if they would play at home just because they're with a lot of mobile games people could possibly just play, pick it up, play for like five minutes and then call it a day. Um, compared to if say you were to be in a lab playing a mobile game for a specific amount of time, like an hour or two, uh, for example, like that's, it's, it's a lot different. You, um, and so I, I don't have any, um, I guess I don't have any data on what it's like for people playing mobile game, like out in just their, uh, in their natural setting. Um, so it'd be in, that's something that I've always kind of been curious about, and something I I learned that I want to know more about um, with that platform. That's cool, James. Uh, similar back to you. Sorry, I have a delay on my question asking skills. Uh, <laughs> back to you on your data visualization. Uh, you mentioned that you did a lot of research up front. Uh, I know players tend to want more, 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 all of the things. Um, was there something that you learned in your evaluation of how to prioritize what information they get to see or like how much is shown on a screen at a given time? Um, what were kind of some takeaways that you maybe learned? Yeah, that was a big challenge. I will actually say um, people think they want more, 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 more. And uh, that's why I always, I'm with my process, I personally uh, start and it, obviously it changes depending on what's best for the project. But like usually if it's a personal thing for me, I start going big and giving people a lot of information because <laughs> I know that I'm going to scale back. Right. And it's easier to cut than it is to add, in my opinion. Um, and when you give them that information, like with the ultimates, uh, like since I had that, uh, that ultimate uh finding that people that actually didn't care about came because pretty much everything in not in uh, that uh, screen uh, the it was a heat map design where you would actually see the ultimates but like uh, you everything was like had something to do with those ultimates so when players kept on saying oh hey well I can't really understand this part of it I didn't even notice that part of it 
Um, and I, they say that they didn't care about the ultimates at all. And they cared about these other features way more, uh, uh, way more, like it was mentioned way more often. It was used way more often. Um, you now kind of have a priority list. And when I was doing the research, I would, I would, of course, uh, I, there were interviews, um, so I was talking to them and writing down what they were saying, or if they wanted to write it down, they could also write it down, uh, et cetera. And then once once I got that down, I took all the tests, collaborated them, and kind of made this hierarchy of like, okay, what was mentioned, and ultimates were taking up a lot of the screen space, and they weren't mentioned once about being wanted. In fact, there were some people that said, I don't even want ultimates and abilities in the game. And I was like, why is that? And it's like, well, I want the game to be like CSGO. Okay, okay now I know what you want, but it is interesting that you say that when I'm seeing this other stuff too. So, all right, and now you know, and now you can cut back, and now you are not, uh, giving a bunch of information to them and all of a sudden it's a lot easier to read and it's a lot more relevant information. It's kind of the same to user research, you know, like you only show the team members the relevant information to them. They don't, they don't care about the other stuff. They don't have time for that, right? Players don't have time either. They're spending time playing your game. They want to have fun if they're on your game, not read too much. <laughs> I think that's interesting that you brought up like it's easier to show more and then pull back later. Um, I feel like that's definitely a thing I did more in user research was show more options and see which ones bubbled to the top. But in UX design, it becomes more like show a few and see what you can keep adding because players react, especially if it goes live, react very negatively to things being taken away from them. Yeah but not so much things given. So like um, coming That's to true. that priority early in the design process is great, um, but then it kind of shifts again during development process to like maybe limiting, seeing how it goes, and then possibly adding like the second thing that's important um, on a second iteration or something like that, since so many things are live at this point. Um, but yeah, that's an in it's an interesting observation of kind of like how things swing during the design process and how things get into game. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Lessons learned. So um, we've done a lot of reflection on this panel, but um, if you had to give students or early career individuals advice, what are some lessons you've learned? I'll start. Um, involving other team members in your studies and your research is super valuable, not only to you, but to them, uh, to the whole project uh, uh, entirely. Um, so what I mean by that uh, is, a very concrete and not every studio I'm sure would want to do this, <laughs> um, but like uh, having natural designers or uh, just developers in general, uh, whoever's relevant to that test that you're doing actually there with the uh, with in, uh, observing and seeing uh, play play testers and just testers in general actually use your product um, is super valuable because they get hand on experience and they also can see uh, firsthand the value of why you're doing what you're doing. So I think it's a pretty good thing uh, to do. The only problem is, is that it's kind of hard to convince people to do, actually be part of that. You have some people who want to, you have some people who will do it if they're told, and you have others who will not at all, which is, you know, people are different. People have different schedules and everything uh, and different wants. But I would say still fight for it a little bit. Like don't, of course, pressure people to do things they don't want to, but uh, I would say definitely fight to say like, hey, this would be super valuable and I think you'll get a lot out of it because it will, it will, bring, the, it will bring the team closer to understanding what you're doing and why it's important. And they, and honestly, I've, I've, seen, I've seen more value come out of that than a very long report. <laughs> that that is very detailed and well done uh and will help but uh not as good as if they just heard from the players firsthand uh what actually was going on um or at least to give them an idea and then you still make the report and now you have documentation to go back on you know yeah um i guess on the next point then um big lesson that i learned is it's okay if things are on fire things are gonna go wrong um, builds aren't going to work. Even if the builds do work, they're going to be buggy messes sometimes. 
Um, or even you could have a whole test figured out, everything's going according to plan, and then participants just don't show up. So all that work is just kind of there. Um, uh, but it's okay. Things are going to go wrong. Knowing how to adapt on the fly and be flexible enough to work around these uh, issues is something I definitely learned, as well as communicating and making sure that everyone involved, whether it be uh, the other researchers or any other devs involved, uh, letting them know what's going on, um, because just having everyone on the same page it makes it easier to find potential solutions. Uh, don't always try to be the hero, quote unquote, um, you know, and try to fix things yourself, uh, because that more more often than not that could lead to more issues down the line. Uh, so yeah, just making sure that when things go wrong, because they will, um, just communicating and making sure that everyone is on the same page so that you can all work together to find whatever solution to that problem. Did you ever have any resources in particular that you felt were useful in preparing for those fires, like fire extinguishers that you collected over time? <sighs> um, <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, I guess one of the big things is always, you know, always testing builds, but even then, um, the, you know, people are always working on stuff and you might get, you might get a team that's sending you a, a new build, you know, the day of testing and you're like, well, I'll, I guess we got to run with it. Um, but just putting on, um, I guess one of the big things is never letting the participants know that something's going wrong. Um, putting on just, you know, your researcher face and keeping that smile and making sure that internally you can be freaking out. That's fine. Just externally being like, yeah, everything's cool. I got this. We're good to go. Uh, because the last thing you want is for participants to freak out as well. And that just adds, to, that just fuels the fire that doesn't need to be there in the first place. I think one of the lessons learned that I found out one of your best allies for putting out fires are the QA and testers, uh, whatever you yes. call them at your studio. <laughs> they are amazing. Become yes. friends with them. They know all the debug. They know everything that's going wrong in the build currently, probably. Um, and they can give you a pretty good update. Um, so they've, they definitely saved me a couple of times in running studies being like, what's happening here? They're like, oh, don't worry about it. Just put in this put in this debug thing and it'll be gone and you're good to go. So you're in that momentary like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And they're like, yeah, I've seen that five times over the last week. <laughs> like, oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, uh, different disciplines maybe um, have different, uh, different values in terms of what kind of information they can provide you. Um, Cause that, that way you can be the, the, you know, the theater mask when mm. things are going wrong while you're typing, don't worry about this. I'm just going to message someone really quick <laughs> and maybe they can help you out. But yeah, well, all right. Career progression and learning what we value. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> I was thinking about what you said. Sorry. That's okay. uh, yeah. Um, I think I have changed a lot in the past three years through the job hunt and like what I understand about everything and hopefully grown and not regressed. <laughs> but like, so I'll talk about like what I value. Um, there are certain just like methodologies to value more and less now. Like when I first started out user research, it was a very rigid process. I know I liked personas and heuristic analyses because they were like very stable and easy to go with. And like, it seemed like something I could just like do check off, check off boxes for. Uh, now that I think I've gotten better, <laughs> hopefully, uh, I use these less rigidly or not at all. Like I just don't value personas as much anymore because I feel like they, it's really hard to cover all the bases of personas. You can lead a team astray with just like a bad representation or they're just like biases that you can't really account for that someone will think of because you could describe something in some way. Uh, it's just really hard to, d to deal with like a persona expectation gone wrong and I just don't like them as much anymore. And if you're here for heuristics, uh, initially I used a lot of heuristics from like, obviously like Nielsen, right? Uh, but I, it was quickly apparent to me that following like a rigid heuristic analysis isn't really apt for games because websites don't really have intentional frustrations. <laughs> you don't go out to make most products intentionally frustrating for people to work with. Like a lot of heuristics don't account for the fact that design intent means creating intentional frustrations for players as like walls. <laughs> so a lot of people when they use heuristics they're using these heuristics that are not meant for games and that 
like are like completely off the route. They're like, oh, okay, well make it as easy as possible for users and make it clear like, but what if it's not supposed to be clear because it's a boss fight and they're supposed to find it. <laughs> and then I, I've seen some students when I uh, ask this question, they kind of just stop and then you can like hear the gears creaking in their head now after they think about like the heuristics like, what do you do in that situation? <laughs> Um, I think heuristics, you're supposed to be more flexible uh, for heur heuristic analyses, especially. Uh, I've gotten way more flexible. I mean, I've been depending on like experience and I know that's like really bad. That sounds like really bad advice because it's telling you like, you just got to get better. But sometimes it, some things are just really hard to learn right off the bat without seeing how like users interact or something. Right. Um, I don't think I would have gotten to the point where I valued like these rigid heuristics far less than I used to if I hadn't just gotten the opportunity to work with so many participants and seeing what they struggle with, um, especially in games. And I think it, I just value that less overall now because of that. Uh, for career progression, I think this is a big one. Like this was the most jarring point for me. Like going into, going into an interview for me, has been a completely different experience from just like working in a job like the mindset i take into an interview is so much more different than uh when i work and it's a weird juxtaposition right like in a lot of interviews not calling out anyone specifically or any company specifically but in a lot of interviews they're just like 60 percent of the questions they had were like research questions trying to drill down on the methodologies you know and seeing like what if you can prove like what you've done and then you know the next steps to take but the rest it was all soft skills they were asking stuff about like conflict how do you deal with people talking to people outside your profession it's uh very and it's useful right like the soft skills are the skills you use during the job that you don't you don't end up thinking about most of the time like you could especially if you're trying to talk to an important role or like deal with hierarchies but like a lot of times you're just talking to people and you need to know how to do that and a lot of the jobs that i've talked like a lot of the job interviews I've had have asked me a lot of questions about that. Trying to drill down like, okay, so what if someone says no to your project? Or what if someone says they don't like what you're doing? Or if someone says you're wrong? And you have to be prepared to do, realize that like, what they're looking for isn't really uh, that you proved your point and that everyone listened to you afterwards. Is that you can mess up and learn from it. Or like you can grow from that experience or you know when to like be malleable towards someone else's opinion. Um, Cause you're going to be interacting with different roles like all the time. Uh, like, I mean, when I was a student, I came in like, I don't know. The idea was not in my head that I would be interacting with people outside of designers and engineers and artists. Right. <laughs> and you come in and you come into the company you, and then now you have like level designers that you talk to and systems designers you talk to, and you talk to another level designer that's like more senior. And then they don't like the same approach that you took with the other level designer. And then you think you're stuck in some hellish groundhogs day loop where you're talking to the different <laughs> same roles, but there are people and none of the same tactics work <laughs> because of like seniority or like their expectations of the role. It's a little crazy. Uh, and it drives me slightly insane, as you can tell by this rant going on right now. <laughs> but like the, uh, like just talking to people in general was very strange to grow in as, as part of my career. Like learning how to do that and messing up and accepting my fellows and trying to grow from them. And like going into these interviews and finding out that people really expect this and now they're asking like direct questions about how you dealt with conflicts is like a big thing. So like if you're students and you're going through interviews, be prepared to talk about when you've tried to argue over someone and when you've messed up because you probably have <laughs> and you don't want to admit it. <laughs> well, well, we have one more slide, but we're, we're nearing on one minute towards time. So uh, I'm going to move to it um, succinctly. Maybe if you had a message to future researchers, um, what would you go? What would you say? If all else fails, you're building confidence for yourself and your teams when you do research. Yeah, uh, <laughs> learn how to play well with others. Um, you kind of move from being a big fish in a small pond uh, to being a small fish in a big pond sometimes. Learn how to build trust with others, learn how to communicate, and realize that you have a lot more to learn than you might think. Um, and yeah. 
decided to keep a fourth bullet point on this one because we thought it was important to cover. So I'm actually jumping in for this bullet point. Uh, document your shit. Like seriously, um, the one thing that I'm super passionate about is documentation because a lot of times as a user researcher, it's very helpful to understand like what were the benchmarks you've made, what are the past studies you've done, and what were the conclusions, how has it changed? Super important to have that history of the data. And as a UX designer, it's important to understand your intent as you're developing different features, and also to understand and maintain your experience, your things that you've changed and iterated on. So that way, inevitably, someone's going to be like, well, have you thought of doing this one thing? And you're like, yes, actually, we have. And we moved away from it because of X, Y, and Z. And you don't have to like try to recreate that in your head, especially if it comes back like a year later. You have all of the understanding of what got implemented, why, and then you can move forward quicker because you don't have to uh, kind of create that again. So document. Uh, thank you for the very professional and mature advice you gave, Jen. I think it's important, but also you should totally bribe people. I think that is a valuable technique to learn how to do as well. <laughs> um, I mean, like inherently I didn't, deep down when I started doing this, I didn't want to call it that. I wanted to call it a different thing. But then after talking to another researcher from different companies, they're like, yeah, I totally bribe people. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, thank you. That's it. Now that you've said it out loud, I feel comfortable saying it out loud too. Uh, <laughs> you should definitely bribe others into <laughs> like listening to you. Like I've gotten particularly good at making cookies and I have my own recipe for it. And sometimes I'll just bring it in and it's made talking to some roles so much easier. Like I, <laughs> like when I make cookies and I was like, I've gotten to talk to data analysts more because of it and they know my name and we interact or like, uh, I brought it to like a producer from before and then like now we still talk and stuff We're like it's a friendly relationship It skips past the initial awkward interaction where you have to ask them for something or ask them to do something You'd be like, hey, do you want a cookie? Hey, can you do this for me now? <laughs> Don't say the now part, but then follow it up <laughs> obviously <laughs> Afterwards, um, I think it's a useful skill to have in general not the broad for it Just like it facilitates the conversation you want to have with stakeholders in a way that feels more organic and natural anyways. So it's it's a good skill to learn. And I think Jen can talk more about this and how she doesn't totally bribe people. <laughs> oh, I never used to bribe people at all, no. Uh, I had the kitchen cookie test. Uh, so similar, cookies are the key here. Uh, you put a plate of cookies out, you put a sign that says free cookies with an asterisk and you say for five minutes of your time, you have people come over and they're like, oh sure, I'll have a cookie. And you're like, but can you answer my survey? Uh, and you've already got them because they're coming for coffee. So they can't say like, oh, I'm really busy right now. Um, and they've already kind of disconnected from what their work is. So they're kind of like pulling away and looking at something new. You get a random sample of your studio uh, and they get a cookie uh, so you know it's it's a strategy <laughs> she did she did a talk about this and everything so it's not it called did. a bribe anymore it's, it's an legit. official <laughs> feedback gathering method. it's a method yeah. yeah it's not called a bribe totally. uh, nope. but it's yeah. but it's a bribe yeah, yeah it's totally a bribe <laughs> all right with that that's our final slides uh, thank you all for attending uh, it looks like we have some questions and I believe we uh, since we are the last one before lunch we actually uh, can stay around and answer some questions so if you're interested um, or feel free to hit us up on we put all of our twitter accounts on here feel free to follow us or dm us if you have any questions special thanks to charles somerville who helped um, he was the fourth one that did a lot of work in creating these slides and uh, over the history and evolving this talk so uh, super appreciate all his help for that uh, but yeah and if you see a star next to their name it means they're looking for uh, they're looking for their next opportunity so keep that in mind Cool. All right. So let's see here. I'm going to open the QA panel. We've got nine now. Cool. All right. So um, I haven't looked at the chat at all. I just have the questions answers open. Um, if it is untrue that we can't stay here, uh, John, let us know. <laughs> Otherwise, let's keep going uh, with that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, with that. The, the, all right. Okay, cool. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for confirming. <laughs> uh, cool. All right. So the first question we had was, thanks everyone for sharing all your perspectives. As a professor, this was enlightening. Many of you talked about the importance of reaching out to various communities for internships opportunities to get your foot in the door sooner rather than later. My question is, how can faculty be more effective in empowering students to get out there? I, th mm, I think I can answer part of this and anyone can just jump in. So part of my I had to, for industry related stuff, I don't think Catherine really helped me at all. And one thing I really did wish is that Catherine told me about all of these. Like I had no idea any of this existed. 
I lucked out actually. I talked to someone on LinkedIn from like a random group page about like careers and in industry or something. And he was like, oh yeah, like I'm a researcher here and we have like this group. Like I found this out through sheer luck that there was a community and everything and that there were like internships for this specifically. Uh, like in general, I think if you are trying to help students take the first, the first step seems to always be like the hardest thing to take, or at least it was for me. Like I didn't know where to proceed. Um, I think if Catherine or any other person just, just told me about the existence of all of, it, all of this, it would have accelerated everything a lot. Um, I was already motivated to do all of this. I just had no idea where to begin. <laughs> uh, if you're talking about like actually empowering students to try to, now that they know and, and like are trying to get ahead, I think it's good to encourage them to really like get involved in the community like as soon as possible as well. Like I think being unafraid to ask questions is a good thing as well. Like uh, there are no bad questions for like a new person to ask. Like everyone's, everyone starts out new at some point. They've had to go through that experience. And sometimes they'll ask questions that we haven't really answered for it's, or like lost and buried in Discord. So like encouraging active participation and allowing people to know where to begin is like a, I think a really good first step. Yeah, uh, I would I would completely agree with what Jimmy said. Um, the big thing that helped me out um, actually was, so for those who don't know, I actually had Jen as a professor for the user research course, and she um, she introduced me to this group. And so that has been the biggest thing that's kind of helped me because from there I'm able to, I've been able to um, just connect with people as well as look for different opportunities and stuff. And so just having um, someone approach me and just give me that first step of telling me where I should be looking um, has been extremely helpful and has gotten me to this point now. So yeah. I concur. <laughs> I think as a student, like it's super important also to take advantage of resources that professors have or to ask them. Like there's yeah. so many people that don't approach and those that do like and are seriously interested, I am more than willing to help. Like more than willing to go find something if I don't know the answer to whatnot or, or point them to a resource um, that I know about. So like, don't be afraid to talk to your professors and ask them like, do you know about an opportunity? Do you know more about um, how I can get a connection? Because even if they can't, they probably are one step away from someone who can most of the time. But I feel like that's often overlooked <laughs> um, or there's some like fear of talking. It's like, no, no, please talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, cool. Awesome. So I'll move on to the next question. Um, let's see here. I would really like to know how someone who didn't study game design can become a UX researcher. Uh, I mean, yeah, I don't you. Did it. All you, bud. Oh, okay. Okay. You're uh, okay. I didn't study game design at all, right? Like my undergrad was chemistry and then my master's was initially computer science and, and then computational media, which is like play like how humans play with different objects not specifically games or anything we're like but it's more connected to it um i pushed for my own research to be related to games i i don't know if that's viable for everyone but um since it was already related i really wanted to do like a master's on game related stuff right and i like you can learn traditional research methodology from people from school just fine like i think that's good uh you learn more of the nuances from others though. Uh, and I don't think you need to know that as early on as you might expect. I think having a strong foundation of user research is really good. And just having a knowledge of games is good with that as well. Like you don't have to, you don't have to study the game design to be a user researcher. Um, a lot of us probably didn't. <laughs> I'm pretty sure most of us didn't study game design to be a UX researcher. Uh, it's a, I think it's a pretty common route to go like psychology or I don't know, HDI, uh, maybe even computer science somewhere along those routes. Like a lot of us didn't start off as game designers. <laughs> you just to make sure that the work you're related, you're doing uh, shows that you have strong research foundations. And if it's related to games, that's a plus as well. And if you can't convey, if you can't, if your work isn't related to games, I think it's good in that case to at least show that you're passionate and knowledgeable about games if you're trying to apply for things, so. I agree. I think part of it is also understanding like if you don't from come from a games like program that has examples, play demos, like do a sample study that involves a game, like just show some passion 
for that particular topic and how you approached it because you will learn along the way too because it is slightly different in terms of some of the questions you ask like maybe some of the discipline lingo like changes so you don't have to be a gamer but it's helpful just like any any topic you would explore like if you're going into say you went into mainframes and you wanted like you wouldn't just go into that i don't know i'm speaking from experience uh <laughs> you wouldn't necessarily like just go in there blind you would at least want to do some research to understand like what what are the stakeholders who you're working with and it's similar for games like are you working with someone who has like a enterprise level or are you working for someone who like is what's what's the context of the problem that you're solving so i think just there's a lot of ways you can do it that's not like I'm becoming a gamer, but watch some demos on YouTube, watch some streams, um, play the game when you go interview somewhere. So you can at least have a conversation about like the first 30 minutes, like that's it. Um, it's not a high bar. You don't have to play it all the time, but at least then you have a, a similar language again. Cause I think we covered that multiple times is being able to learn the language of other developers is important from either art or design standpoint. So, but yeah, that's part of it. Any thoughts, Matt, Jean? Uh, yes, I really but I want to move on games, to other so. questions That's too. <laughs> okay, we can always come back. Yeah. Um, as someone in design program management with some light training in UX and UR, would it be sufficient to be qualified for a GER role by leveling up via Coursera courses? Sorry if I said that wrong. Um, or do you feel that an academic scientific background is necessary to get into the role? I personally don't. I feel like I'm going to get glares from two people here but i personally do not think that it's necessary um i think it gave us well i wouldn't even say ours me and matt exactly maybe a little bit was exactly scientific um so the the beginning was and obviously the uh the psychology classes that we've that we've taken that uh that have improved our research um uh are obviously that but I will say a lot of the, the hands-on experience is almost way more valuable than anything that you could learn personally. Um, that's how I see it. So yeah, do whatever uh, you can to level up, 100%. Yeah, uh, going off of what James said, um, yeah, I personally, I personally have learned more through hands-on experience rather than um, what I learned from like just different uh, courses in research and psychology. Um, just because I've personally found the games industry, the way we approach research and stuff is um, there are a lot of things that are different than um, research in academia. So just getting that hands-on experience, uh, definitely, I feel like I've learned more personally. Uh, I am biased. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really think that an academic scientific background was for me necessary uh it taught me like why i do research and also gave me like a structured experience to do it right like if you mess up in academia you have a professor to tell you how you mess up whereas like if i had messed up in um like not working in an academic setting and had no one to guide me what if i kept messing up from there on like and no one corrected that i think that is different for everyone, right? Like you can, there are different ways to get that kind of experience. I just liked the structure of academia and what it could teach me in that time and the people I could learn from. Because it's not just about your professors, it's about your peers. Because your peers are also researchers, right? They're also going through all that. They have the same problems as you do or they have knowledge in different areas. Like sharing that kind of knowledge was really useful for me. Uh, I don't think it's necessary. I just think it's really, really helpful. and. I don't think the degree looks that bad either on your resume. <laughs> That's also a plus. Uh, academic gives you a time to dedicate to learning that. Like I think sometimes yeah. it can be very difficult to learn it on your own. So it gives you a dedicated like here's a timeline and here's like content to look at. So from that point of view, it depends upon I'd say personally like how you learn. Um, some people do really good at like picking up things on their own, but other people it helps to have that like like rigorous uh sort of like uh more of a i don't know rigorous is the right word but like outlined 
uh, format of content to go through and be forced to like, now you're going to be doing this exercise. All right, cool. Yeah, I'm Jen, call me out. <laughs> <laughs> but like, it can be helpful, but some, like, personally, I, I mean, I went to school for it. So like, I can't say, I can't say anything. I found it useful to have the time dedicated to actually like dive into a topic and take subjects that, that were used, that were like relevant. Um, but like, I don't necessarily think it's absolute in any way like I feel like there aren't a lot of absolutes anymore um, I feel like there used to be requirements that were way more absolute than they are nowadays you're starting to see more variety um, whatever works for you to get kind of the skills necessary um, would be possibly a way of doing it um, I haven't seen any of the Coursera courses so I can't speak to like what contents in them either so yeah part of it is just like make sure that you kind of maybe like the Grux Discord is probably a great place to post like here's a syllabus for this course does it look relevant <laughs> and getting kind of like a, a quick thought process on like will this help you or is this kind of just for fun might be a way to approach it as well um, all right next question I wanted to hear more thoughts about quantitative versus qualitative user methods in games where is the industry headed right now <laughs> Oh man, that's like a whole panel. <laughs> yeah. What are we allowed to talk about? <laughs> I, I think I think this is probably a great week. Uh, was it weekly question for James to take down? I think so Someone too. Could note that for James. Uh, <laughs> I think or write that down for him. Um, I personally, I think my my summary for this. If you guys have any thoughts on it, let me know. But I think it's largely dependent upon the company and kind of like how it's evolved over time. So I don't, there's probably trends, but um, I think it's not absolute again. I think it's got a lot of changes, which is what we're hearing um, from from people that are interviewing and getting jobs as it kind of depends. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think it really changes across companies. Uh, some companies still try to be data driven. <laughs> uh, uh, others are like more, sp they have more openings for specialized roles like data analysis and stuff and things like that. I imagine the smaller the company is, uh, th probably the, the more hats you have to wear as a user researcher for both um, and have to do more methods related to that. I think it's really dependent. <laughs> that's, that's a tough question, especially since I don't know what I can exactly talk about <laughs> for what I've done. So, <laughs> okay. uh. All right, I'll, I'll make a note to add that and we can follow up at a broader thing. Next question, at James, what is something you've learned from a project where a client didn't find your research or findings useful? What did you do? Cry. Um, <laughs> no, uh, I would say I have a couple uh, that, like I said earlier, like when they don't find it useful, it just, you know, kind of gets ignored, right? So you kind of just have to move on. I will say that first, but uh, that doesn't really help. <laughs> so um, there was a there was one project I was working on where I did uh, research and uh, did data viz and everything for them and gave them this data and they said, well, we can't really use that anymore because we've already changed the project too much for that. So now I know, right? Now I know that the pace that they're working for, I didn't know at the time. Um, I I thought it would be like a week turnaround date, but the project was at this point where it was changing every day. So it was kind of like, okay, this needs to be a bit more rigorous. So you kind of just have to change how you go about it. Um, and for that one, I couldn't really change with that project because that project was at its end, which is why I was changing so much. Uh, but with another project where I was at its end and it was changing so many little things, I, instead of doing... Uh, a week turnaround date since I had the control to do this. I talked with the, the team and I said, okay, so what I'm gonna do is for the next two months, I'm gonna do tests and they're all gonna be roughly around the same build, but we're gonna have on the report that it's this build to this build. Uh, and I'm going to make a very large report and we're gonna do some changes after. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna look at, you'll look at that and you'll use that report to you you use that report to finish the project essentially um at this point the the team was kind of like cut in uh half so uh this was easy to kind of convince people to do because they're like well you're kind of you're kind of the 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 bouncing off point anyway so we're going to do that uh and that turned out to be really useful so 
Um, I would say, the, like, just in general for that answering that question, um, if you do not want, if you do not find that your research is turning out to be useful for that team, then you just need to change how you're delivering it. And I don't necessarily mean even the content that's being delivered. I mean, like, when it's being delivered specifically. That's usually when, that's usually my, my experience when things aren't useful, when you're too late with your findings. Um, when you're when things are moving too fast and you just didn't keep up with that for whatever reason. So yeah. And it looks like someone was actually transferring over. Thank you from the QAs from the chat. I just got through the chat and was writing <laughs> post-it notes instead. But so <laughs> I'll just read the, the the actual questions. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm curious on what the panelists think are battles that they have to fight in a team setting. Get rid of that. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. So I guess, uh, or at least speaking from uh, dealing with designers, I guess at school specifically for me, one of the big battles you have to fight is dealing with very stubborn designers, um, especially in a student setting where you know a student like we're making games right and essentially someone comes up with this game and that's that's their baby right and you go ahead and you run the tests and you come up with the findings and you're essentially like telling someone that hey your baby is ugly right <laughs> that's that's kind of the thing um and it really hits specifically with or at least personally with dealing with students that's what i found is people take it very personally and um, they haven't quite learned how to keep their personal feelings um, set aside from uh, their professional um, kind of feelings and stuff. So that's kind of one of the biggest battles that I've had to face is how to how to word things and how to make sure people are not taking things personally and saying, hey, <laughs> essentially saying, hey, your baby's ugly, but here's how we can not make it as ugly, right? Um, and trying to word things and make sure you're not burning that bridge and keeping maintaining that relationship both personally and professionally um, and so that's that's probably one of the biggest battles um, that i've dealt with uh battles i think I, there are two separate battles i think <laughs> uh the battles you have with like people like in a team as in like shareholders and then the battles you have with like your te established team, like if you're on a centralized team or like non-centralized, right? Like we mentioned before, some of these tests go wrong and then people will have differing opinions during that test in like that one minute span where you have to decide what to do next and it has to be fast. Uh, I think there are those types of battles where you're gonna be pushed to potentially fight for a solution you think is right, but will very much hurt potentially in the long term. Uh, of that test just because it slows things down and like causes more friction than necessary and then obviously like when you're trying to convey research to other shareholders uh there are quite a number of different battles you <laughs> have to have i think and that you might encounter it's just like um the, the battles are different across like from other researchers and from shareholders themselves uh i don't know how to get into this more specifically but if you happen to have a more specific question uh, I think you should feel free to message us about this and see if we can't dive in deeper to something you wanted to know about, if we're allowed to. <laughs> yeah. In abstract terms. Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll move on to the next one. This is for James about research about esports. Why do you think players did not care for the alt use and seeing it on the timeline? So to clarify, I don't think that players didn't care it's just that they cared the least about that to be specific so that is that is an important difference right um so because like if there was only a couple things and i could keep that on there and it wouldn't hurt the experience of other players but help the experience of a few players that would do that but in reality it would it was a thing where it was uh only a few players would care and it would hurt the rest of the uh experience for other players because it was cluttering the screen so like just to clarify uh with that um but in general the reason why i think that they did not care that it was the least cares because on the research i was actually doing they i i 
I wrote it down on the actual thing, but I don't have it open with me right now. Sorry, but just essentially it was the lowest on the priority list for players. Uh, and that priority list was based on um, mentions of it, use of it, uh, and use mentions of that feature, use of that feature, and then uh, just just verbal telling what they actually wanted out of this feature, out of this whole uh feature as a whole so uh it was it was lower on the thing and then when i got into actual specifically asking them the questions of like especially near the end when it was like okay it's a pretty common thing that people are like just being like i don't care essentially about ultimates um i need to i'm gonna ask specifically about that and then you get the anecdotal in reality, but you know, all research is anecdotal until you put it together, right? Um, <laughs> uh, that's a joke. <laughs> it's a joke, that, <laughs> but uh, it's uh, uh, when I ask those specifics, I kind of got an understanding why. If honestly, I think it has to do with the project specifically. So, uh, with that project, uh, the goal with the ultimates was for them not to be and I'm quoting the lead designer on it, uh, not I win buttons. <laughs> so essentially they compared to something like uh, like Overwatch or even, um, what's another game that has ultimates? Uh, League, there we go. Uh, well, actually I would say, I would say to give an analogy with that game, with the game project that I'm talking about, uh, it was Quasar League, uh, they, uh, it was a student game. They, the ultimate was, about as much impact, if not less, than like an ultimate in League of Legends, uh, and definitely way less than an ultimate in like Overwatch. So uh, Overwatch, an ultimate can change the the rate of a game. Uh, well, in our game, it was more of uh, we want people to use it when it comes up and not save it for the opportune uh, moment because we want to just that was the player experience that we were going for. So it depends, right? Uh, and the reason why I thought that is because of those reasons. The reason why I thought maybe in the game what it was, that that's why I would think that is because of how we were designing it. But that's also like an inference, not a, uh, not a thing that people said. Yeah, I'd probably require more detailed studies to get at exactly what about that wasn't conveying potentially. Um, yeah. It reminds me a lot of Supers and Destiny. Uh, <laughs> a lot of history about how that came about but moving on to the next topic uh going to into the job or internship market between cover letter resume and portfolio is there any is there one more sorry i can't i'm gonna start over is there one that's more important to get right than the others any advice on getting from the application phase to the interview phase should i be pressing answer live to like answer the question at oh you're yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah, i can i can click on <laughs> there we go i got it oh, we're answering it. live now okay cool <laughs> uh resume 100 percent the resume yeah um, i I'd, I'd agree for any of my roles i've gotten i've actually haven't written um cover letters so that might be like <laughs> a hot take, but some people like cover letters. I think there is a potential to screw it up and make it look really bad for you. Uh, I haven't actually written a cover letter in a while now. Uh, for everything I got an interview for, I've been using resume early on. I think the cover letter, if you don't have as much experience, I think the cover letter does really help in, in showing like uh, what you can care about. Uh, like explaining more about yourself, like why you're a good fit for the role. Uh, but I haven't written one in a while. So this is, that's just my take. I think the resume is the most important. <laughs> I would say portfolio personally. I would say portfolio, especially for uh, if you're UX, pretty much every application will say that they require a portfolio. So um, nailing that down is super important, but I would also agree that the cover letter is the least important. I keep that super short because I ain't going to waste anyone's time. Yeah, I'd say um, for me personally, the, my resume has been the thing that's gotten me um, interviews and stuff. Um, not to say that the other things aren't important, uh, just personally speaking, uh, I, I find my resume to be the, the thing that shines in compared to all of those. Um, things. 
personally as a hiring manager, I like seeing cover letters. Um, <laughs> it helps give me context for who you are uh, it, it, from that point of view. So it doesn't need to be in depth, but personally, I feel like it's important um, for that point of view. It's similar, I think, to what John just said, which is like it helps especially give a context as to why you're interested in the job. Maybe that's it. Um, but just to have that understanding, um, I think it's also potentially different for user researchers versus UX designers. For UX designers, portfolio, way more important um, yeah. than, than potentially what it would be for a user researcher. Um, it seems like ever. Tom disagrees. He likes seeing a portfolio or a website um, over the a cover letter. But I think, um, I think definitely for me getting some context as to like what are some projects you've worked on and kind of your thought process, the website portfolio is super important for, for uh, user experience designers. Um, yeah, I think you have to be careful with a website too as a user researcher. Like if you have a, yeah. <laughs> a website that's just really unintuitive, I think that really goes counterproductive to what you want to portray as like an applicant. But yeah, yeah I think uh, like a website would be great. Um, I don't think I've ever had a portfolio for user research though. A lot of stuff I just can't really talk about in a portfolio. <laughs> like I can't put down, this is the project I did. Uh, and I felt like the resume covered up like what I did during those projects in general or what I did in like a workplace. So I've always kind of just stuck with the resume, it, but it seems like I'm the only one here who cares about the resume the most. <laughs> so, Like I said, I think it comes down to like, I want to understand your process for UX design, which can't be displayed in a, resume that's yeah. not longer than it should be <laughs> also have opinions about length of resumes but we'll move yeah, on I, I think everyone has opinions about that. <laughs> yes. very different ones yes, yes. Length of resumes is a hard one <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 uh, but um yeah basically my my take from that because i'm sure the follow-up would be like what what do you mean by that is like one to two pages is great um Beyond that, you're, why? <laughs> that's when maybe you should have a website. <laughs> like, maybe that solves it. Maybe that's the fix. Um, but like, yeah, uh, it kind of depends upon I think the the role that you're going for potentially. Uh, and what a you website can, feel. Yeah. No, go ahead. Oh, uh, making a website feels really good once you get it done, because then you're <laughs> like, hey, look at all the work I did. I didn't do nothing for the last whatever many years. <laughs> yeah, keeping it up. <laughs> yeah yeah uh, yeah but yeah no i agree it's it's nice to also form your thoughts on it because then if you create i feel like if you create the website you've gone through the thought process of defining like here's my process here's what i've done and so in the interview when you get asked about that you're like oh i've got this because i've already thought about how i want to present this so maybe if nothing um it's a good process and kind of preparing for some questions that you're going to probably come up with in an interview uh, I think some people in the Discord have actually put up examples of their resumes. Like I think, like a lot of the established user researchers have. Um, if you want examples, like they send you one early on that got me like the super early jobs, and then what my current one that got me like more of my the next job. <laughs> <laughs> it's like changed and what I did. If, if you want it, but I mean, just message me. I'm sure, that'd be interesting. All right, I'm going to consider this done and there's some chat stuff too to follow up with that so be sure to check I think what I'm hearing is um oh very interested in length of resume I'm going back up um <laughs> there's a lot of conversation about this one <laughs> yes this is recorded uh uh LinkedIn is uh feels like a cover letter so Tom goes there to look uh for activities and all that so check there uh John said cover letters are uh really do really matter if you have non-traditional background for the job because it helps you to understand like why your geology degree prepares you to become a games writer. <laughs> Write the damn cover letter. Um, and then let's see here, LinkedIn um, could, I would include LinkedIn in website because then you, know, you can curate that as you're interviewing. Um, and then do actual information. Uh, All right, done. Cool. Next question. Uh, oh, doing the answer live thing messed up my ordering. Uh, all right, here we go. How do you present your academic? Right. How do you present your academic work, masters or PhDs work, in a way that makes sense to non-academics in the industry? Uh, are you talking about like getting funding? Uh, this one. Uh because for funding, it's just, I think, 
just knowing what they value and just trying to pitch it to them that way. I usually don't talk the same way to like the the stuff written on like a poster or a paper. I usually, I almost never talk that way. I think it's very apparent how I talk right now. (laughs) 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 Wow. (laughs) Thanks for for telling that, Jen. (laughs) Yeah. I never talk like I'm uh, presenting a paper or poster board. Uh, It works adversely to me for some researchers. But like, I think for shareholders, it's fine. Uh, I take a really casual approach to talking and just discussing the work and how it might benefit them and why they should give me money. And this is for funding, of course, not just to random strangers. So I'm just accosting for cash on the street. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> that's, that's how I do it. Uh, I don't know if you're talking about different contexts. Like if you're trying to present academic work in like a portfolio for applications or something. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> I don't know how like the presentation would be different than maybe like doing a quick summary paragraph and then linking to it like I have no problem with reading academic work so I don't know if there's any disagreement there but like I feel like maybe a quick summary that maybe isn't written like an intro to a white paper but like here's what I did here's what I learned find out more here totally work Um, yeah I guess if there's more context let us know we'd be able to uh, dive into it a little bit more um, and figure out if there's a deeper answer to that. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? All right. Other than learning how to bake cookies, what are some skills that you would encourage a student to build and improve before pursuing a career in this field? You caught me. That's my whole skill set. (laughs) Really (laughs) unraveled me at the core. (laughs) You found out who I am as a human being. just like conflict resolution, I think. Just like being able to talk to different teams. If you have the opportunity, if there's like a game design club in your campus, it's a great way to start, right? Being able to talk to the different members uh, of the team who are like making games. We're really, it, it's definitely not an accurate representation of <laughs> like what a company company team would be like, but at least it gives you the chance to talk with the designers and kind of potentially come up with the same issues that you might later on. Like, uh, I think that's something that, all people getting into UX definitely know should know how to do is like just talk to the different roles or at least designers. <laughs> yeah, I'd I'd agree with that. Just knowing how to talk to not only designers but like just any any role in general and knowing how to um, just be open to that. Um, yeah. I agree. <laughs> it's settled <laughs> United. I, yeah, yeah i would i would say learning how to talk to people differently as well like learning how to uh kind of i guess read someone's uh emotions <laughs> in a sense uh while you're talking to them because like you're going to be saying things like like uh, i don't know if it was matt or jimmy but it's funny because it used to be the talk of this panel of like why is your uh why is your baby ugly or uh, (laughs) whatever the whatever the analogy was um but like like you are essentially saying that like it is it is even it's why like uh jen when she when she taught us uh how to make reports she says hey don't say what went wrong say what could have gone better it's the it's the whole like how to how to kind of talk to people be be gentle when you are when you're bringing up the the not so good stuff because it's your the goal is to make positive be uh, make productive change right so just learn how to kind of approach every situation with that. I think cookies is an analogy for how to be approachable. Yes. Like yeah. that's basically <laughs> what the cookies are is making you approachable, but you have to take it from there. Like you have to be approachable past that cookie. <laughs> so <laughs> that's true in all the situations, depending upon who you're talking to is be approachable. What does that mean? Figure out what that means for you and how you can kind of like utilize that for your own personality. Exactly, Ollie. You got it. How our baby could be pretty. I love it. That's uh, shit at Ollie. Uh, yes, there's some good chats going on. <laughs> cool. All right. So we are over time. You are welcome to keep going as long as you'd like, uh, at least till one. 
But I don't want you to feel like you have to. That's or, uh, <laughs> this definitely went on longer than I thought. I yeah. To, yeah, I have to go into the apartment browse. So. Okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah, there are more the questions than I anticipated from this, yeah. so that's good. Um, let me just read the last three and see if there's anything in here that, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, this got moved too. Thank you so much. Um, so the we have three left. Um, I think let's let's do the next one really quick, and then I'll read the next two while you guys are answering. <laughs> uh, all right. Hello. I've had the chance to play test for a AAA dev, but how do I parlay that experience to the user research side? I can't openly talk about the experience due to NDA. Any tips? Uh, I would say see how they conduct the test. I this one I'm not really sure about. Mm -hmm. uh, to be frank, I don't know if there's much that you can transfer. If you were, do you mean you were play testing or? I think that's how I took it is that they were a play tester in a yeah. study. Yeah. I think it's hard to translate skills from that side. Uh, I think things you could do is like see how they were operating things like what you were asked. I mean, if the, you were given survey questions, obviously don't re repeat the exact same survey <laughs> questions. But like uh, what you take in, I think tells a lot about the process as well. So if anything, you could learn about the process and see how you could create something similar, or at least you know how a structured test would look like. Yeah, uh, I guess off of the NDA thing, just no specifics, obviously. Uh, keep things as general and as broad as possible, and generally you should be fine. Uh, I, mean, I don't like being generally fine when the yeah. boss is <laughs> I mean, yeah, but fair, but I'm yeah. sure this does not come back to you. Don't talk about whatever product you're testing. Don't talk about yeah. the company. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I would say uh, take note of the difference probably in atmosphere, especially if you've uh, uh, the difference between a triple A studio playtesting a game and then me while I'm in school playtesting a game is very different in the atmosphere, right? Uh, and I think I think it's probably it's difficult to know how to how to do that on your own and sometimes just impossible. So knowing how they how they actually get that comfortable atmosphere for their testers is is super important and I think that's probably the the best thing that you could take from on the play testing side is is because you are literally experiencing that at its fullest so more comparative than actual like hey I'm experienced because I've had this experience more of like hey based upon what I've learned here's how I could apply what my experience was and what it was like mm -hmm. cool. all right well we're past 12.30, um, there are two questions that we had left, um, or no, yeah, we're closer to 12.40. <laughs> Let's, uh, I'm gonna wrap it up here. Sorry for those that didn't get the, the last two in. Um, feel free again to reach out to us, or um, I don't know if there's a way that we can record these or post it in Discord and tag us. Like, we're all in there, so feel free um, to look us up and we'll be happy to take those further have some time to chat about it later. And yeah. thanks to you for that was great.